Our topic for this session is hepatic vascular emergencies. We'll begin with two cases of Bud Chiari syndrome. The first, the acute presentation of chronic Bud Chiari. The chronic Bud Chiari usually behaves more like veno-occlusive disease with inflammation and occlusion of the hepatic veins and narrowing of the IVC. That results in turn in abnormal perfusion of the right and left liver lobes. They share a venous drainage, hepatic veins, and will be relatively hypodense and relatively atrophic. Compare those to the normally enhancing and hypertrophic caudate lobe. The caudate lobe has a separate venous drainage direct to the IVC and so is not typically as involved in this type of Bud Chiari syndrome. Note also intraperitoneal fluid consistent with portal hypertension and the narrowing of the IVC. You'll see on higher cuts the absent hepatic veins, most likely inflammatory, whereas this IVC narrowing could partially be inflammatory but also can be clearly attributed to the caudate lobe hypertrophy. Let's look at that caudate lobe first. Note the difference in enhancement, and it's marked enlargement. Next, let's look at the liver vasculature. The hepatic veins absent, and the IVC markedly narrowed. You can see tiny origins for the hepatic veins. You can see where they should be right at that level but certainly no opacification within them. So that is a Bud Chiari syndrome, acute presentation of chronic Bud Chiari syndrome. Our next case is the more acute form of Bud Chiari syndrome, this usually related to hypercoagulability. There is heterogeneous parenchyma throughout the liver, as well as a nodular contour. In addition, there is absence of the hepatic veins and IVC, which in this case are of normal size. You can again appreciate the heterogeneity of the hepatic parenchyma, the nonspecific hypodense gallbladder wall thickening so frequently seen in portal hypertension, hepatitis, as well as cholecystitis. Appreciate the lack of enhancement throughout the intrahepatic IVC and its lower enhancement. Obviously there are webs and filling defects within the lower IVC consistent with non-occlusive thrombus. And again appreciate the absence of the hepatic veins right there. There is that non-specific gallbladder. And appreciate as well the nodular contour abnormality adjacent to the gallbladder fossa and in the medial segment of the left liver lobe. I have found this to be one of the earliest places that you can see that nodular contour abnormality in early cirrhosis. So this was the relatively acute presentation of Bud Chiari syndrome. Our next case is of portal vein thrombosis. The most important thing to appreciate here is the difference in parenchymal enhancement. The right liver lobe is somewhat more hyperdense compared to the left liver lobe. And that, of course, is the phenomenon we're all familiar with. In the case of portal venous thrombosis, the affected portion of the liver will have preferential arterial enhancement and so will be hyper dense. Intraperitoneal fluid as one might expect due to an increase in portal venous pressures. So you can appreciate the extensive filling defects throughout the entirety of the right portal vein. You can see some contour abnormality inferiorly suggesting this is more of a subacute phenomenon, and you can also appreciate the difference in enhancement between the right and left liver lobes. 
So that is a right portal vein thrombosis. Our next case is a hepatic artery aneurysm with acute hemorrhage. You see the aneurysm here. This is a common location high in the portal region. And here, a small focus of extravasation. There is fluid density all throughout the portal region, which you'll appreciate on the movie, related to that active hemorrhage. So there you can see the aneurysm of the hepatic artery, beginning there off the celiac. An elongated aneurysm, and there, coming directly off it, is small focus of extravasation consistent with aneurysm rupture. And again, appreciate the fluid density all throughout the portal region as a result of that hemorrhage. So that's a hepatic artery aneurysm with acute rupture, extravasation, and hemorrhage. Our next case is a superior vena cava occlusion. This is, of course, a chronic condition and not necessarily an acute one, but it does present acutely with some frequency. This is a very worthwhile finding to know about. You can see this ill-defined blush of parenchymal enhancement all throughout the anterior portion of the liver, and you can see early opacification of the hepatic veins, or preferential disproportionate opacification of those veins. Lastly, there are clearly dilated anterior abdominal wall vessels. Lower down you can see that those actually feed a dilated umbilical vein. So there is the venous, parenchymal, and umbilical venous. Contrast enhancement. Let's look at those again. Hepatic venous, parenchymal, and umbilical. So high up, you can see the hepatic veins are showing early contrast opacification. If we follow those up, you can see them feeding the IVC. A little lower down, you can see that well-circumscribed but sort of wispy parenchymal enhancements surrounding the falciform region. You can even see small foci of portal venous gas here, which are unrelated. They actually performed a liver biopsy on this patient and fortunately did not create a massive hemorrhagic event. And then let's go a little lower and see the source for that parenchymal opacification. And it is that dilated um, umbilical vein which you can follow up into the liver, see the parenchymal opacification and the hepatic venous. So this is a case of superior vena cava occlusion with rerouting of venous blood through the umbilical vein and hepatic parenchyma. So when you see this finding in the liver, the first thing to request is a CT of the chest. Our next case is one of chronic passive congestion. So you can see the prerequisite findings here that we have cardiomegaly, obviously previous sternotomy incision and valve replacement surgery. The liver demonstrates the classic nutmeg appearance with hyperdense nodularity throughout. And in addition, you can appreciate the distension of the IVC and the hepatic veins consistent with chronic backflow and venous stasis. Here again, the dilated IVC and hepatic veins. And of course, let's again appreciate the widespread hyperdense nodularity centered around the portal triads in a classic nutmeg appearance. So that is chronic passive congestion and nutmeg liver. Our next case is one of a closed loop bowel obstruction with ischemia 
causing extensive portal venous gas. Can't have a hepatic vascular lecture without showing a case of extensive portal venous gas. Obviously, this is a poor prognostic finding and typically is associated with overwhelming ischemia or infection. Here you can see the affected bowel loops, thick-walled bowel loops, stacked and dilated with significant mesenteric stranding. These are all the classic findings of a closed-loop bowel obstruction. And you note small foci of extraluminal gas here in the mesenteric fat, showing you definitively that these uh, bowel loops are ischemic and are the source of that portal venous gas. Again, the thick-walled bowel loops and mesenteric vessel distortion, which we will definitely appreciate on the cine, and uh, which obviously goes hand-in-hand -hand with the ischemic changes we are otherwise seeing. So first, the portal venous gas, typically more peripherally distributed than biliary. You can see even involving the periphery of the caudate lobe. I think it unlikely anyone will miss that, uh, either that finding or its significance. Let's look now at the dilated and stacked, thick-walled bowel loops. Appreciate the mesenteric stranding and the small foci of extraluminal gas and portal venous gas there in the mesentery. So a classic appearance of a closed-loop bowel obstruction. Let's next look at these mesenteric vessels though and watch them spin and then reverse direction. So one direction and then the other direction for that spinning of those mesenteric vessels. A good indicator that bowel ischemia is on your differential diagnosis. So that's a closed loop obstruction with bowel ischemia and extensive portal venous gas. Our last case is a portal venous fistula. This can be congenital, post-traumatic, or I think possibly most frequently related to a prior hepatic biopsy. You see this massive, dilated, tortuous venous communication, which on the cine you can really appreciate communicates between the portal vein and the adjacent hepatic vein. So here it is, coming from the portal vein, communicating with the hepatic veins. You can see that early hepatic venous return coming ultimately off that left portal vein. So that is a portal venous fistula, again, probably most commonly resulting from biopsies, but potentially post-traumatic or congenital. And that concludes this session on hepatic vascular emergencies.